Almost two years ago, in my very first video on this channel, I talked about ancient views on medicine, ending it by promising to one day make a video on the phenomenon of sex being prescribed for medicinal purposes. And that's what we're here to talk about today, specifically in the Middle Ages. Ideas about sex and sexuality have their own history, just like any other idea or concept. And the medicalization of sex brought a whole new way of thinking about and approaching the act in ways which may seem surprising to a lot of people today when thinking about the Middle Ages. Of course, that isn't to say that the reception of this form of therapy wasn't... complicated. You'll see what I mean. The medieval world was a thoroughly Christian world, and that obviously had an impact on medieval views about sex. For the most part, people in the early Middle Ages, or at least writers, believed that too much sex was no good. Now, this wasn't unique to Christianity. Several of the most prominent strains of ancient philosophy which predated Christianity were also weary of unrestrained sexual gratification. In fact, they were generally critical of any unrestrained desires and gratification, seeing temperance and moderation as virtuous and good for the mind, as well as the body. And this is reflected in ancient views about medicine, which put a great deal of emphasis on balance, most famously the balance of the humors, which was a basic premise of the Hippocratic medical worldview. But Christianity put even more emphasis on the dangers of sex, especially in the West with the adoption of the views of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine believed that sex was always sinful, because it required arousal, which was an irrational state, which he believed only existed because of the fall of man and original sin. Although God created marriage as a framework for legitimate, less problematic sex, since he also commanded that humans be fruitful and multiply, sex was still the reason why original sin was inherited to all humans and therefore why one needed baptism, unless you're conceived asexually like Jesus or even Mary, as some argued. Again, Augustine didn't invent the idea that restricting sex and resisting sexual desire was ideal. Both inside and outside of Christianity, you had people who were praised for temperance and sometimes extreme levels of asceticism, sexual or otherwise. But Augustine's theology had a big impact on attitudes towards sex and the connection between sex and damnation. The idea that restricting sexual activity could have a negative impact would have seemed ludicrous. The idea that having more sex would make you more healthy? Equally ridiculous. But that would change in the latter half of the 11th century. You see, ancient medicine was not inherently hostile to sex. In fact, Galen, one of the most important figures in Roman medicine, criticized the Epicurean philosophers for saying that sex was always bad for you. Ancient, as well as Arabic physicians, who inherited the ancient tradition when those works were translated from Greek into Arabic, still talk about moderation, but rarely complete abstinence. Sex ultimately got absorbed into the concept of the non-naturals, that is, largely external factors which have an impact on the body's balance and therefore one's health. Typically, these non-naturals are divided into six categories, food and drink, sleep and wakefulness, exercise and rest, airs, retention and evacuation, and mental states. Sex could be a form of evacuation, a form of exercise, and it could have an impact on one's mental state, though whether this impact is positive or negative may depend on who you ask. The Persian physician Al-Razi noted how lust can be harmful to one's mind and therefore one's health, largely following classical philosophical views about temperance, but also notes in another text on sexual intercourse that it can have some beneficial effects as well. Other scholars writing in Arabic also recommended sex as a treatment for melancholy, a term used for any number of disorders of the mind, including depression. Most significantly for us, sex was included in a list of the non-naturals by the Nestorian Christian scholar of Baghdad, Hunayn ibn Ishaq, in his summary of Galen's Art of Medicine, called The Questions About Medicine. Hunayn's work would be translated and adapted into Latin in the 11th century by a man named Constantine the African a monk of the famous monastery of Monte Cassino in Italy, who was from North Africa and therefore knew Arabic, and translated several medical works under the patronage of the Bishop Alphanus of Salerno. 
Constantine would translate Hunayn's name as Johannitius, and his work as the Isagog, which means introduction in Greek, a text which would become one of the most important readings for medical education in the medieval West for centuries, even after Galen's own works, which were originally in Greek, were finally translated into Latin, in part because of how useful the Isagog was as an introduction. All this to say that pretty much every university-trained physician from about the 12th century on was learning from the get-go that sexual intercourse was medically significant and potentially beneficial. But even more important was another work by Constantine called De Coitu, on coitus or sexual intercourse, which was probably another translation or adaptation, but we don't know from whom. In any case, this work goes into detail about how sex and reproduction work, even explaining that God made sex pleasurable in order to ensure the continued reproduction and survival of animal lineages, because if they didn't enjoy having sex, they wouldn't do it, and therefore they'd die out. It then discusses the effects of sex on the body. Constantine notes, as was the standard view in Hippocratic Galenic medicine, that each person has a unique bodily makeup, their complexion, including which humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, and qualities, hot, cold, wet, and dry, were dominant in them, both overall and in their various organs. For sex, it was the complexion of the testicles which was most significant. I should point out here that medical discussions about the effects of sex on health are almost exclusively concerned with men. Although the ovaries were seen as analogous to testicles, most medical writers took for granted that they were discussing men, unless explicitly stated otherwise, and Constantine is clearly talking about men. The Trotula, the most famous medieval gynecological work, does say that suffocation of the womb can be caused by lack of sex, as the womb craves moisture and starts to choke the other organs, but the prescribed treatment is ointments and other medications, not having sex. Anyway, in Constantine's view, the nature of one's testicles had an important impact on one's sexual desire. Hot testicles means lots of lust, cold means little, as well as seminal production. Moist means lots of semen, dry means little. This was super important for sex because someone who produced less semen could be harmed by having too much of it, as it would strain them and weaken them, whereas someone whose testicles were of a hot and moist nature could have frequent sex with little negative effects, and in fact would find it very difficult to endure abstinence. Constantine actually notes two medical conditions where he recommends sex as a remedy. Quote, Firstly, a person who has excess phlegm that is not viscous and who is vigorous. And on the other hand, a person in whom a sharp, volatile, smoky vapor abounds, which by its very nature infects the body's temperament. In the first case, he says that sex is helpful because it helps evacuate the phlegm in the form of semen, and the rigorous motion of the act causes condensation and drying. However, this is only to be done by those with strong vital powers, since sex will drain some of them, vital powers being a sort of natural force in the body which controls respiration, emotion, and, importantly, heat. Someone with weak vital powers will have their body cooled excessively after the sex is over, which throws the body out of balance and might just exacerbate the issue. Again, balance is central to this understanding of medicine, and Constantine even recommends that one should always have sex under the conditions which ensure the greatest balance for the body. And because of the draining of vital powers, which is why one feels weak and tired after sex, he recommends that you have sex before bed and not in the morning, or at least that you get plenty of rest afterwards. He even says that if you have too much sex too often, and especially without any rest, you can drain your body of all of your powers, and even die. In the second case, that of the vapors, Constantine notes that the rigors of sex will dissolve and evacuate the excess fumes. But in this case, the cooling and resting of the body is even more important, so sex should only be had sparingly, at the right time and in the right context. Aside from these two conditions, he also notes the positive effects of sex for one's mental health, though abstinence does tend to lead to a longer lifespan, since you don't drain any of your bodily powers. As you can see, the ideal of moderation is retained, even as sex is discussed in a purely medical fashion, without reference to morality. Constantine's De Coitu was widely copied in the Middle Ages and became an important resource for physicians. But just because he was able to talk about sex in neutral terms doesn't mean that moral questions about sex stopped being important, 
especially when the theory of sex being used for the improvement of health was brought into practical reality. We get an early glimpse at this fact in the works of the 12th century English historian William of Malmesbury. If you know this name, it's probably from his famous and widely popular Deeds of the English Kings, but he also wrote a slightly less well-known work on the Deeds of the English Bishops. In that text, he talks about a former Bishop of London, Maurice, who was consecrated shortly after the publication of Constantine's works. In an early version, William writes, Hugh was followed as Bishop of London by Maurice, a man restrained in other pleasures, but more centrally devoted to a self-indulgent love of women than befitted a bishop. There was a persistent rumor that the remedy prescribed by his doctors was to look to the health of his body by the emission of humors. He was, indeed, unlucky to have to safeguard the flesh by endangering his soul. In a later version, William would change this passage to just mention that Maurice had a tarnished reputation. He seems to have heavily edited the later version of his work in order to remove a lot of the brutally savage bits which may have offended some of his audience of which there were a lot in the original. The man missed a calling writing diss tracks. So it's unlikely that this was just because he didn't believe the rumors to be true. In any case, this passage is really interesting in light of what we've already talked about so far. It may be tempting to assume Maurice just made this up as a justification for skirt chasing. And although that's not impossible, William's description of the doctor's prescription sure fits well with Constantine's. If Maurice really did need to regularly emit humors through the love of women, his doctors may have determined that he had an excess of non-viscous phlegm and strong vital powers, and his inability to restrain his lust despite being restrained in other pleasures may well have been caused by the hot and moist temperament of his testicles. A life of celibacy could well have been deadly for him. If the doctors in England were working off of Constantine's writings so early on, they may have had access to the text sooner due to personal networks amongst the Normans, with Maurice being a Norman bishop under William the Conqueror, and Constantine working for the Bishop of Salerno around the time of that city's conquest by the Norman adventurer Robert Guiscard. Also significant is the fact that William doesn't seem to doubt that such a prescription is reasonable, regardless of whether or not he believes the rumor itself. He calls Maurice unlucky, in Felix, for having to choose between the health of his body and that of his soul, implying that this is a real dilemma, and a terrible, but believable, position to be put into. The mention of danger to his soul is an important reminder that in practice, medicine can't be considered separately from morality in the Middle Ages. Maurice was a bishop, and not only that, but he was a bishop in the time of the Gregorian reforms, which, amongst other things, sought to enforce the idea that the clergy had to be celibate. William even mentions earlier on in his work that Maurice was one of the bishops presiding over a council at Westminster in 1102 which sought to implement these reforms, including in its articles that clergy above the rank of subdeacon had to take vows of celibacy, and that priests who had illicit relations with women were outside the law and couldn't lawfully celebrate mass. William then notes that pretty much all the articles of that council were violated within just a few days and the first to do so, he claims, were those who attended it, another passage removed in later versions of his work. This means that sex for medicine in the case of someone like Maurice could be highly controversial and scandalous. Maurice may well have seen his doctor's prescription as a legitimate exception, but William clearly did not. Though William doesn't outright condemn Maurice for his decision. Like I said, his words imply that this is no easy choice, and many others likely would have done the same, whether due to fear of death or love of passion. However, for many theologians throughout the Middle Ages, the choice between temporary flesh and immortal soul was a choice with only one right answer. A man who would agree with that sentiment, although not himself a theologian, was King Louis VII of France at least according to a story about him recalled by the Cambro Norman priest, Gerald of Wales. This tale comes from Gerald's book titled The Jewel of the Church, which is a compilation of praiseworthy examples for the moral education of clergy. In this example, which John Hagen believes Gerald heard about when he was studying at the University of Paris during Louis VII's reign, Gerald recounts of a time when the king fell sick upon returning to Orléans after two months campaigning in Burgundy. His doctor and others determined that this was due to his prolonged abstinence from sex, and so the king called for his wife, Adela of Blois. But it would take time for her to arrive, and the king's condition was dire, 
So the doctors, along with the bishop and several other important clergymen, all agreed that the king should send for some other woman who could be with him immediately. The churchmen even assured the king that he would incur no sin for this, as they would take responsibility. But the king nevertheless refused, saying he would rather die celibate than live as an adulterer, and instead trusted in the mercy of God, who rewarded Louis's act of piety by curing him. Now, this story is highly hagiographic. Its purpose is to have a clear moral message as an example for others. So, whether everything went down exactly as Gerald says it did is questionable. But even so, it's significant that Gerald, and seemingly everyone attending the king, saw this as a genuine medical condition. And the fact that Gerald relates it without having to defend it implies that most people would have thought it was plausible. Gerald also doesn't look down upon the doctors or others suggesting this cure, even when his position is that the king was right to reject it. The king's recovery was miraculous. It was divine intervention. Under more typical circumstances, the king may very well have died, and sex could have saved him. In fact, this is exactly what happens in the next story told by Gerald, that of an unnamed archdeacon from Louvain, modern Leuven in Belgium, who was elected bishop of that city, but was hesitant to accept the office due to his inability to control his desire for women, seeing his lust in his current position as much less heinous than it would be were he a bishop. Nonetheless, he's convinced to accept, and he restrains himself in order not to disgrace his office. But he soon gets sick, and despite others urging him to discreetly take a mistress, he continues to refuse and ultimately dies, with Gerald calling him a martyr. This bishop's condition seems to be perceived similarly to Maurice's, though the Bishop of Louvain makes the difficult decision for his soul and the dignity of his office, whereas Maurice chose his mortal body. King Louis's choice was slightly different. The churchmen around him supposedly removed the danger to his soul altogether, though this was likely only because it would have been a one-time thing. And also, you know, he's the king. But a king didn't have to abstain from sex like a bishop. Like I said at the start, Christianity recognized the legitimacy of sex within the confines of marriage, the confines which Louis refused to breach. Now, according to some penitentials and other sources, there were ideally some restrictions to be had even for sex between husband and wife. Sex during Christmas? Bad. During Easter? Even worse. Sex on Sunday? Pfft. Don't even get me started about sex on Sunday. But generally, in reality, as long as it was confined to marriage, sex was perfectly fine, healthy, and normal. So, for most married laypeople, a doctor's prescription for sex would have been uncontroversial. And even though it was considered a sin, sex outside of marriage was not all that uncommon. Prostitution was even accepted at various times and places as a useful, if distasteful, profession. Even some clerical writers saw it as a necessary evil to prevent young men from deflowering more quote-unquote decent women, and it's not unlikely that a few unmarried men visited the brothel from time to time on the doctor's orders. It's clear that medieval views about sex were complex and nuanced. The Christian tradition which praised celibacy made it even more so. There's a lot more that can be said about medieval understandings of sex and sexuality which will have to be left for future videos. But in the medical context, a great deal of complexity arose from the adoption of a medical tradition which was concerned with understanding the body separately from morality. That isn't to say that ancient Greek, Arabic, and even more contemporary medieval medical writers weren't concerned with morality, but the emerging medical understandings of the body, and what was good for it, could still be at odds with what was good for the soul. Not that this was entirely new, the idea of a battle between body and soul goes back a long ways. But it wasn't really until Constantine's works that we see sex viewed as a possible way of preserving one's health in the medieval medical worldview. Though, keep in mind also that sex in some instances could still harm you. So keep an eye on your humors, as well as how much pubic hair you have, because apparently that can be a sign for the complexion and temperament of your testicles. And if you don't have testicles, well, tough luck, I guess. Maybe it'll help you with your ovaries, I don't know. With all that said, thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.